All right, we're finishing the book of 1 Corinthians today. We are in chapter 16. It's been an honor to preach through this entire book. What I like to do at the end of each sermon series is to spend that week prior uh, reflecting on uh, and thinking about all the things that God has done in and through that particular book of the Bible. We've been in 1 Corinthians for the mo- most of 2023, and so it's been a long year uh, of study. But, man, God has done great things. If we'll remember that this, this, this people, the Corinthians, they have... Uh, they have uh, Paul has addressed many issues that they have had. Many issues, uh, whether it be relational, uh, familial, uh, financial, uh, spiritual, uh, uh, sexual. He's addressed them all, and he's done so thoroughly. And so, uh, what we do, we're coming, kind of coming to the finale. And so, this is the end of his letter to this church whom he loves so much. So, this is the end of a letter that Paul is writing to this church that he planted. And so. Um, if you're a guest with us, my name is Al, and if I haven't got to meet you, I'd love to after service, but uh, uh, it's time to pass up Bibles. That's what it is. If you, need a, if you need a Bible, go ahead and raise your hand. One of our ushers will bring you one. If you don't own one, that's our gift to you. And so what we're looking at today is ministry. Paul's ending a, a book of the Bible, uh, a letter to a church, and, a, and he wants them to, like any other letter he writes, to continue the ministry, to continue the mission. And so I want to think about the mission is the ministry. And, and, and ministry is, is really where, where Jesus and people intersect. That's where ministry is. And so it's the job of the elders to equip the saints for the work of ministry. And so we've uh, spent time in the in uh, First Corinthians all fall actually looking at different spiritual gifts, how God has gifted the church, the, the entire church, not just the preachers and teachers, for types of ministry to serve one another. And, and the point is to point people to Jesus. So it's ministry, like I said, I'll, I define it as where, where Jesus and people intersect. That's where ministry happens. And so it can look like hospitality. It can look like administration. It can look like what I'm doing today, preaching and teaching. And so uh, if, we, if we will, let's go ahead and turn in our Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Uh, if, if you don't have one, like I said, uh, the ushers will bring you one, but we are in chapter 16. It will be on the screen as well. The first thing I want us to see about ministry is ministry uh, requires money. And so right when you start talking about money, especially uh, uh, if you're new to church or new to this church, people get squirmy. And so it's okay, squirm it all out. We're going to be here for a little while. And so uh, he says, now concerning the collection, this is mean the collecting of money, for the saints, for, for a particular church, for a particular ministry, for, for ministry purposes, as I directed the churches of Galatia, uh, so also you're to do. So I, he's, he's telling this command to not just this church, but other churches as well. He's talking about money. He says, on the first day of every week, each of you should put something aside and store it up, that as he may prosper, uh, as one, so this is as one's producing income, that's what he means, as he may prosper. As, as you're producing income, he's saying, we store aside uh, money so that... There will be no collecting when I come. So when I show up, the apostle, when I show up, when I arrive, um, we don't have to do a, another fundraising campaign, but I'm, I'm sending out this letter to y'all gather the finances so when I show up, uh, verse 3 can happen. When I arrive, I will send those whom you've accredited by letter to carry your gift to Jerusalem. We'll talk about that in a moment. Um, and if it seems ad- advisable that I should go, I will also accompany, or they will also accompany me. Paul is fundraising. He's writing a letter to a church. He's, he's directed a lot of things to this church. He's talked to them about how they should uh, uh, you know, steward their, their gifts, how they should uh, organize their marriages, how they should live their lives, how they should, uh, we've talked about the resurrection of Jesus, the, the coming of Christ, the, the second coming. We've talked about it all, and at the end, he's saying, in order to keep this ministry going, and not just in this church, but in other churches, it, I, it takes money. He's fundraising, and so he's asking the, the, this church to put aside money for uh, ministry purposes, and that's what he's doing. And the reality is, ministry requires money. It really does. It requires a lot more money than you actually think. The reality is, it, it really does. Just like if you've ever uh, owned or operated a business, and you're like, man, I never thought about these things. You got to pay taxes? Like, yes. Uh, if you don't, you go to jail. Uh, and, and, and nonprofit tax is different, and, and, and self-employment tax is different, and, and all these different taxes are, are different. Moreover, there's personal personnel cost, operation cost, technology costs. By the way, those things change all the time. Uh, you're always in need of new equipment, uh, especially for a church like us, set up, tear down, uh, rent. Those things change. Facility needs, hospitality needs, 
different church partnership needs, uh, mercy ministry needs, and the list could really go on about the, the, the more people, uh, there's more ministry opportunity, which requires more money. And so this young church in Corinth is growing. The other churches, like uh, he's written to in Galatia, but also in Jerusalem, they're growing churches, and they, he, Paul is gathering the saints together for this important moment to uh, uh, fundraise for the ministry. And so he says, set aside money, he says the first day of the week. This is the New Testament term for uh, Sunday. Um, that's what he's saying. That's when the church would gather. The church of Jesus gathered on, quote, the first day of the week because the, Jesus rose from the dead on the first day of the week. And this is why we still gather on the first day of the week, Sunday, because we're celebrating always the resurrection of Jesus. And so he says, when y'all gather, essentially when you gather, hey, set aside money. What he's saying is, uh, do this regularly. And he says, as you may prosper. So he, he's, he's, some people get paid monthly, some people get paid weekly, some people get paid uh, uh, at different times. And so he's not, he's not making a hard and fast rule that, that every week you have to give if you're not getting paid. What he's saying is do this regularly. As you are making money, as, as income is coming in, set aside money for this special offering that he's requesting they participate in. And so he, he's talking about regularity here. In verse 3, he's also concerned about uh, the appearance of misuse of funds. And so there's this, uh, he, he doesn't want funds to be misused. So he says, you've written to me, and there's people that you've already set aside to help carry this gift to Jerusalem, because that's where the money's going. And so he says, if need be, I'll go with them. And so he, he does not want these funds to be misused. And this is, no, we, this, we, there should be uh, uh, church, uh, in churches, we should focus on the, the handling and the appropriation of money. And so Paul's doing that here. He doesn't, want the, he doesn't want to misuse funds. And so lastly, he ultimately, what he's saying here is he's asking for them to contribute to a special uh, offering, a ministry fund that he's going to take and deliver to this church in Jerusalem. And so what I want to do right now is just give a little context for the, the, the Bible and money. And so the Bible speaks to money far more often than you probably think about it, um, and, and far more than most people are comfortable. But here's the reality is, uh, the, God speaks of money, possessions, uh, and possessions over 800 times in the Bible, and 25% of Jesus' teaching was on money, wealth, possessions, and stewardship. So if I was going to be super biblical, Jesus style, like every fourth Sunday, we'd be talking about money. And so we don't do that. We do it as, it, as uh, uh, the, the scriptures speak to it. And so, and here's why. The reason why the Bible speaks so much about money is not because God is after your money. He already owns it all, by the way. Uh, he, he, he doesn't need your money. Uh, and it's, it's actually not your money. We'll talk about that in a moment. But uh, the reason why is because God's after our heart. Jesus teaches that where your treasure is, your heart will be also. And some of you uh, have been taught that, that money is the root of all evil. It's not true. The love of money is the root of all evil. Money is a, a tool. Money is a tool given to us as a gift by God to steward. And so money is not uh, evil, uh, but loving it is. Also loving anything other than Jesus is evil, by the way. Just so the, the point is that the love of money give, is, like a, is, a, is a root that gives, uh, that gives access oftentimes to, to loving other things other than the God of the Bible. And so the Bible speaks to this because, like Jesus says, where your treasure is, your heart will be. God's concerned about our heart. He's, he's concerned about our worship. He's, con he's concerned about our love for Him. And so the Bible speaks uh, so much about money because it's usually tied to, to how, because how we view money is usually tied to one of two things. How we view money is usually tied to one of two things. Uh, our view of God if you view money uh, and, you're very, and, you, and you feel like you don't have much and, and you feel stingy with your money, you probably feel that God is a stingy God, uh, not very generous. It's just it's actually true. And you're like, I got to hold on to mine because I don't know if I'll have mine tomorrow because I don't know if God's going to provide tomorrow. I don't know if he's going to be there tomorrow. And there's this, this anxiety around money. Uh, uh, and the, uh, the other thing that we could see, the way we view money shows how we view God. Moreover, uh, uh, it shows what we really worship. Like I said, money isn't evil. But, but the love of money is, or how we use our money usually points to the things we love the most, the, love, the people we love the most, the, 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 the hobbies we love the most. Now, I'm not against hobbies, not against people, not against generosity or wealth. What I'm just saying is that money is a tool given to us by God. And when you hear a pastor talk about money and use the Bible, everyone gets stressed because they're afraid their idols are about to get talked about. And so it's not my fault. That's, you know, yours. Uh, and it's just... Like I, it's just, it is. And so we love God and we should use money. Um, and that's what will happen. If you love God, you will use money to worship God. But if you love money, you'll use God to get more money. 
This is where the prosperity gospel comes in. And what we reject it is this, this idea, we love money but not God, so we'll use God to get money to, to prove that we are, we're somebody or something and that God loves us more than we thought he did because God blessed us. Well, you're living and breathing and living on earth right now, that should tell you that God loves you and you're blessed. That the fact that you have clothes on your back, you're here in, uh, in your life. God loves you. God loves you. Uh, and he does bless you. He does give us money. And we're to steward that money uh, unto worship of him. And not just in the church, in every part of life. The way you, you, you handle your finances in your own personal life, uh, in your own home, in your own family. Like that's all should reflect the way God uh, views you and loves you. And, and we should steward that unto the worship of him. Sunday is not just worship. Giving to the church is not just worshiping with your money. How you spend your money everywhere indicates who you worship, how you worship. And so, uh, being, for example, we talked about in the spiritual gifts, the gift of hospitality. That may mean you need to, sp- to make more money if you have that gift in order to steward it and spend it on other people because you got a gift from God and it costs more money to have a gift of hospitality than maybe uh, the gift of, uh, you know, teaching. I don't know. Uh, just food for thought there. Um, and so the point is, God is after our heart. God is after our heart. And so what I want us to think is that, uh, that everything we have is a gift from God. It's literally a loan from God. Our kids, our jobs, our lives, our money, our time, our talent, our possessions, God owns them all, and he's loaned them to us to steward. That's the story of the Bible. God owns everything. He gives things to us, like our life, to steward. To, to, to be a, a steward who is to be found trustworthy. One way to look at it, like the, I like to think of it this way, is like we are part owner of God's stuff. We're not the full owner of anything, but we are part owner of God's stuff. We're part, God, God gives us his stuff and says, you're part owner of my stuff. And so the issue is we often don't see it that way. We think God is going to, this is, we often pray like this, God, help me with my money. No, we should be praying, hey, God, help me steward your money. This is your money. Help me steward your life. Help me steward your kids. Help me steward your church. Help me steward your stuff, your possessions. Like, well, I worked really hard to earn these things. Okay, maybe you did. Praise be to God. But imagine if you're a parent, if you're a parent, and you have a child, and you bought them a toy, as, as many of you have for your children for birthdays, Christmas, whatever, and you, you bought them something, you bought them something, they, and they say the words, this is my toy. Correct, your toy. In one sense, it's your toy. But whose money bought that toy? Like, your money bought that toy. It's kind of like our toy, right? Like, it's our toy. Like, it's, like at the end of the day, like, it's, it's your toy. Like, I'm going to let you use your toy. You're going to steward your toy. I'm probably not even going to play with your toy, but, like, it's our toy. Like, it's our toy. Some other kid comes to the house and they take that toy. They didn't steal from you. They stole from me. Like that, that's, that's who they stole from, right? Like it's, and that's what it is. God sees the same. We're his kids. He's given us some stuff. He's given us some great stuff, like a lot of stuff. And he's like, this is my stuff. I, I love you. And I'm going to give you a lot of stuff and I'm going to give you gifts, but this is my stuff. Like I get it. You th- it's, it's yours, but it's like ours. Like I bought it. Like it, I know you worked hard, but like, you know, I gave you the, the legs to do that work. I gave you the breath to breathe. I gave you the, the skills to do that. Like, I actually gave you the opportunity. I actually gave the person who gave you that money the opportunity for them to, like, the whole thing. Like, I, I created the whole thing. Like, that's God. And so we, we, we need to have a biblical perspective on how we view our things and our stuff. And, and so uh, to continue to help us with that biblical perspective, I'll let us know this, that uh, Old Testament like the, the requirements for uh, what was actually lawfully required of God's people was far more than, than most people actually uh, pay attention to. Uh, we, many people know about the tithe or 10% that was required. Uh, uh, so the 10% was the, the first 10% of their gross income uh, of God's people, but it would only go to fund one ministry. That, the 10% of all of God's people would go to fund one ministry, and that was the ministry of the Levites or the priests. There was more ministry that needed to get done. It was only the ten, the, the tithe went to the Levites. They didn't get any land. They didn't get, uh, uh, they got a tenth of, of all the other tribes, stuff and, and land. And so they, they, that's where they got their, uh, their income. Just the Levites, just one office, one ministry uh, was funded through a tenth. 
So there's an additional uh, tithes and offerings that were required of God's people throughout the Old Testament in order to pay for things like festivals, events, celebrations, which if you read the Old Testament, they're partying all the time, which is something I think is awesome. Um, like 10%, another 10% went to uh, festivals. Uh, and this is because they, they believed in community building. They believed in relationships. They believed in celebration. We see this in Deuteronomy 12, 17, uh, chapter, four, or ch- uh, chapter 14 as well. Additionally, what about the poor, those who are in need? There was another 3% uh, re- required of them to help give to the poor, Deuteronomy 14. Crops were addition- additionally collected for the poor as well in Leviticus 19. Um, and other occasions required other funding. We see this in Nehemiah uh, chapter 10. Uh, and so God's people all in all, mandatory requirement, Old Testament church, uh, usually resulted in upwards of close to 25% of their uh, gross family income went to God in his ministry. It's just how it was. This is why, and this is Old Testament, this is before the Romans ruled over them, this was before, this is why, like when Rome took over and, and Israel was allowed to practice their worship, but they were being taxed by the Romans, and then Jews were selling out to, to work for Rome, this is why they were so upset with tax collectors, because they were already giving God, what they, they, originally what they were not supposed to be ruled by anyone but God. God was to rule them, God was to oversee everything, and then man, man, they did not want that. They wanted a king, they wanted to be like every other nation, and get ripped off by their government. That's what they wanted. God tells them that, actually, that's another sermon, but God tells them that before they go, he says, hey, they're, they're going to be tyrannical in their, their requirements of you, and they're taxing of you. Like, yeah, it's okay, we want a king anyway. Like, that's what we see throughout the Old Testament. And so, but God required his people uh, to fund the ministry because they were a part of the, God's family. This was family business, family work. And so the, if, you, if you remember, some of you are like, man, that seems like a lot. Well, just remember, God owns it all. This is, this is why we go back to worship, God's efforts. His, his family was like, okay, this isn't our money. This is family money. This is, we're, to do, we're to steward it according to his, his will and his ways. That's why the different tribes gave to one another. They all gave to the Levites was another one of the family uh, ministries. They gave to the family ministry. So in the New Testament, however, uh, financial giving was among... Uh, it, it, things changed in a different way uh, uh, in, in that uh, the New Testament at least epistles focus on grace, generosity, and the heart of someone actual than one's percentage. And so when the, the, what I want us to see is when we give to God, when we give to God, we're not deciding how much wealth of ours to give, but rather we're determining how much of God's wealth are we going to keep and use for ourselves. And so uh, we're going to get into the principles of giving from the New Testament next. And so God's people today are not required in the same sense as I just described of the Old Testament laws. We're not required by law to give in the same manners according to the same customs of the Old Testament. However, like everything in the New Covenant, everything in the New Covenant, when Jesus shows up, he, he exceeds the Old Testament law. When he says, hey, hey, he says, don't commit adultery, well, that was Old Testament law. He says, in the New Testament, if you look at a woman lustfully, you've already committed adultery. If you, he says, don't murder, but if you have hatred in your heart for someone, you've already committed murder. Jesus takes the Old Testament law and he exceeds it. So I don't want us to see that, uh, oh, we're not required uh, but with a percentage. So uh, what does that mean? Well, I want us to, he gives us principles now that should guide us according to his abundant grace. And so he says this in uh, 2 Corinthians and. Um, uh, eight and then also chapter nine, Christian giving should be willful and cheerful. These are principles. These are principles of New Testament giving. It, so what he's saying in these verses is that each one should give as they've decided in their heart, meaning willfully. They must decide in their heart. This is a command by God in the New Testament to decide in your heart how, what you'll give. And, and he says, not give reluctantly or out of, under compulsion. God loves a cheerful giver. It's possible in the Old Testament that there was much giving out of compulsion. The point he's making here is not that he's, he's saying the Old Testament law, uh, that it wasn't God's design. What he's saying is that he wants, God, he wants God's people, uh, their hearts, to be con- congruent with his ways. And so God wants us to have a willful and cheerful heart. It says that God loves a cheerful giver. Like, yeah, it's like, what does God love? Cheerful giving. Well, I thought you were going to say, like, I don't know, giving to the poor. No, he just loves you to give cheerfully. To the poor, yes, to anything. Whatever you're giving to in his ways, do it cheerfully. 
And second thing, principle, uh, giving should be done in a regular pattern of life. This is what we see in our, in our, in our uh, verse today, in chapter 16, verse two. 2. On the first day of the week, they set aside money, right? That, that's what he's commanded. It should be, giving should be regular, a regular pattern of life. Number three, giving should be in proportionate to one's ability. Same, for chapter 1 Corinthians 16, verse 2, he says, uh, set aside something, right? As he says, as he may prosper, as one is, is, is bringing in income, one should do so according to their ability. He's not saying, hey, take out some credit cards just to, to, to help fund the ministry. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, uh, you're giving a por- according to uh, your ability. He also says you should do so... Number four, our giving should be generous. I'll give you all the verse references in 2 Corinthians 8, Proverbs 14, uh, Proverbs 31, Proverbs 19, 2 Corinthians 9, 1 Timothy 6. Eight. It is clear that, that God, especially in the New Testament, the principle of giving is that we should be generous. We give because God gave. God was generous in his giving, not just of the blessings of this life, but of his one and only son. So Paul speaks to this fact that we are to give generously. In 2 Corinthians, the church there, they, uh, uh, so if, in 2 Corinthians, Paul is writing to the Corinthians talking about the Macedonians. The Macedonians were uh, uh, impoverished. They were under extreme poverty. They were under a lot of financial strain and pressure. But he says that they overflowed in, in, in overwhelming generosity, that they were generous even in their poverty. They gave beyond their means. They trusted God, and they, they gave generously. New Testament Christian giving should be marked with uh, according to one's ability in so that we are generous. So sometimes when it comes to like, well, well I, I can't give according to my ability because all my money is tied up in, in hobbies. Well, that may be true. Uh, and so he's, the New Testament Christian should want to give generously like the Bible prescribes. And again, it's about worship. It's not about someone taking your money. It's like, I want to participate in what God's doing. I want to be a part of that. And number five, New Testament giving uh, uh, requires that Christians should be sacrificial in their giving. Jesus taught uh, about a woman who had two small copper coins, um, and, and, and when she gave all, she, she gave that, and that was all she had left. She gave out of her, her poverty as well. She gave sacrificially, uh, and, and, and God rewarded her for that. And that's the thing that we got to understand, and this is what I teach my kids. If they are very generous and with the things that they've been given, say it's gum. I talk about this all the time, my kids and their gum. Uh, when my kids steward their gum, in a godly way, and they share it with their friends. And if your friends, if your kids get gum from my kids and they end up in your washer, like, I get it. It's my fault. I'm, 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 you should check them before they get home. Uh, no gum at church, do we tell them. Uh, and so uh, there's this, the reality of my kids, if, if they steward it well, man, then when we run out, when I go to the store, we'll get more. But if they are stingy and they're selfish, and they don't share, guess what we're not getting next time we go to the store? Gum or whatever it is. If they're, not, if they're stingy with their stuff, it's not that I'm withholding, I'm teaching them. So the, the more generous they are, the more it comes back to them actually. It's the same principle of the New Testament that when we're faithful with little, God gives us much. It's not, it, this is a God-given principle and idea. And so the, the, the church in Macedonia and Paul's telling the, the Corinthians and 2 Corinthians that, I mean, they gave beyond their ability on their entire, on their own, they gave, but they gave willfully. I mean, God rewards that. They trust God to continue to provide for them. And so the point here in all this is that, uh, the, that ministry requires money. And so I wanted to give us a, a biblical context for the use of money, how the money was used in the Old Testament, what was required of, of God's people, what are the New Testament principles that guide. So when Paul's asking them, he's just saying, hey, when I show up, we're, gonna do a, we're doing a giving fund, I expect y'all to give. Like he, he doesn't give them everything I just gave. Why? Because he's written to all these other churches, and, and these letters are, are, are likely circulating. And as he says, I've already directed this to Galatia, so you can talk to them, see what they were saying. Like, the point being here is that this New Testament church, they understood that, that ministry required money. When Paul shows up, we're going to need to give because we've got to keep this thing going. We got, we've we got to play a part of it. This is not our money. This is God's money. We've got to be willful, cheerful, and joyful in our giving. Uh, we, we've got to, we should do it regularly, as Paul just told us. And the New Testament is clear that it should be generous and sacrificial. They had this working understanding of, 
of how to steward their money. So when Paul, all he does is show up and say, hey, I'm, sh- I'm coming up, man, make sure the money's set aside. It's like some mob boss is what it sounds like at first. Like, hey, when I show up, you better have the payment. Like, you're like, that's what it's, you read it and you're like, dude, he's just saying, I'm going to show up, make sure you put aside the money so when I get there, I don't have to deal with it. That's, that's what it reads. It kind of sounds like. And so he's not a mob boss. He's a, he's a pastor, and, he, and, he, and he's, he's expecting the church to operate according to the New Testament giving principles. I say that because that's my hope and prayer for us. And so Paul is asking the Corinthians to set aside money for when he comes. And I'll say this. Next week, we will begin our annual end-of-year giving campaign. I didn't plan to preach this. Um, well, actually, we planned to, to preach this sermon last week. But we went longer on, on the gifts. And so we plan to have a, a week off, uh, a, a standalone sermon. But we, we're here now, and uh, next week we start our end-of-year giving campaign. So it's God's timing on this. And so next week we will begin a end-of-year giving campaign. We do this every single year. Uh, this year our goal is $35,000 to raise above and beyond our regular tithes and offerings. Uh, we'll talk about more about what that is and why uh, uh, and what we're, we're asking God for specifically in the next year. We'll talk about that next week. But I wanted, what I want to do here is just like Paul saying, hey, when I show up, I want y'all to be ready. When that giving campaign opens up, I want y'all's hearts to be ready. So we're going to spend an entire, the whole campaign is going to last seven weeks. You'll have seven weeks to, to join and be a part of it. But I want you to begin right now asking God to prepare your heart to be a part of that and how he would want you to do so. According to these principles, not according to, to manipulation. I'm not manipulating you. I'm not trying to, to urge you to do anything that God has not required. What I am asking you to do is to, to play a part of what God is doing. What the, uh, my goal for our church is that everyone would participate. Every single person participate. If you have $1, that's awesome. 50 cents, that's awesome. One penny you found on the wind, great. That's what I'm saying. Like, there should be no, I, I, my, my prayer is that everyone would willfully, joyfully, cheerfully participate according to their ability in a spirit of generosity and with sacrificial giving. And so sacrifice looks different to every single person, every single part of your life, in every single season. What we're just asking is that I'm asking that you would prepare your hearts to play a part of this. Right now, we are currently uh, operating, we have been for quite some time, on a semi-emergency budget. We're making it. We're not, we're not overspending. We're doing, we're stewarding well. Uh, but for the past year, we've had to really, really, because, you know, costs have gone up in the world we live in, uh, and uh, our income hasn't. And so we really need another, in addition to uh, our end of year giving, we need about $7,000 a month just to kind of open up our normal regular budget. Uh, um, and so if you're not, what I'll say this, if you're not giving uh, regularly, I mean, that's our first ask, because you'd give regularly. And then if you're able to, Give to the Christmas giving campaign or end of year giving, then do it. Um, and so that, this is, this is my, my prayer for us and my encouragement to us is that we would give regularly as God's word commands uh, and, and as God has uh, moved in your heart and then begin to prepare your heart for the end of ye, the year and, and what God may call you to give in that regard. And so this is essentially what Paul is asking this church in Corinth. And so ministry requires money. It also requires planning. So next we look at Paul's ministry calendar. So uh, he says, I will visit you after passing through Macedonia. And I tend to pass through uh, Macedonia. Uh, So he tends to not stay in Macedonia long. He wants to pass through it. Um, And perhaps visit some churches there. And he says, verse 6, and perhaps I will stay with you uh, even spend the winter so that I may, so this is why he wants to stay, so that you may help me on my journey wherever I go. For I do not want you to. Uh, for I do not want to see you now, just in passing. He wants to stay longer, and I hope to spend some time with you, if the Lord permits. Uh, I will stay in Ephesus until Pentecost, uh, for a wide door of effective work has been opened to me there, and and there are many ad- adversaries. And so, uh, what I want us to see this is that there, ministry requires money, but ministry also requires planning and a calendar. It requires, some of you are like planners, like, yes, amen. What I've been doing largely for the past uh, two months is spending most of my time uh, focusing on the next year's calendar, the 2024 calendar. What we do is we, uh, I start in the summer, begin praying, and we're planning, and then we start to finalize that at, in, in the fall. And so we have every sermon series planned out through the fall, um, we, or, or sorry, through 2024. Also, I've been working on a study guide for uh, the series that's coming in January. We, in order to do stuff like that, you've got to have a calendar you got to plan for those things paul has a plan 
He's saying, I, I want to come to this city now, but I can't because i got stuff I'm going on here. And I don't want to just stay there for a few days. I want to I spend longer time with you, so I'm going to wait till, till I have more time to come. And so his desire is to stay and spend the winter with him, he says. Uh, and, and this is what ministry is like. He, it's, it's, you've got to apportion your time and your calendar uh, differently for different seasons with different people and different, different opportunities that God gives. And so the reason why Paul wants to spend time with them, did you, if we notice, is that, uh, is that so that you may help me on my journey wherever I go. Like, one of the things he wants them to do when he shows up is like, I'm going to need your help. When I get there, I'm going to need your help. I'm going to need food. I'm going to need money. I'm going to need lodging. I'm going to need travel. I'm going to need maybe some companions to go with me on ministry. I'm going to have needs. Uh, Paul needs also to be ministered to as well. Like pastors need pastors. So he's like, I'm going to show up and like, I want to stay long. I don't want to just be there for a short stint, but I want to be there for a long stint. I want to minister to you. You minister to me. We got we to gotta make some plans. We need some funding. We need some stuff to go. I, I, I need some help. I may, and, and so I'm coming to you, and this is the reason. Additionally, he clearly wants to help the Corinthians where he says, I hope to spend some time with you, especially after he writes this letter. Like, right, if you remember the contents of this letter, he's like, hey, one of these things, it's like, hey, if that guy's still there who's sleeping around with that person that's his mom, stepmom, when I show up, like, it's going down. Like, he, he did warn them about this. So he's going to show up. He's got some stuff to, to, to clean up in the church in order to stabilize this young church. But notice he's open-handed about ministry and his ministry opportunities. He says, if the Lord permits if the Lord permits. So there is, we should plan. We should plan, but we should be open for when God changes plans. And so the way I like to think of it is like there's planning is, is very important, but so it's pivoting if necessary. Like, like we, you should clearly plan, and Paul is clearly a planner. He's, he's laying out some plans, um, it, but he's open to God changing those plans. So the way I think of it is, is you pray, and ask God for direction, um, and then we, you start making a plan according, according to what God's revealing or, uh, or, or stirring in your heart. You, you make rough plans. You, you outline plans according to God's uh, will, word, will, and ways. And you're like, oh, I think this is what, wise counsel, this is the plan for the next year, for example. And, you, and then after you make the plan, you continue to pray because God could change the plan. And so you pray, you plan, you pray, and then if you need to, you pivot. And then you, you keep praying. You're always praying, but, you, but you're open to whatever God would do. And so we must hold our, our, our plans loosely and openly. And so we will begin to share some of our 2024 plans and goals, especially with the giving campaign coming up. Like, why are we raising $35,000? Why are we looking for that? What are the goals? What's up and coming? What are we believing God for in this next year? What are we holding open-handed, asking God to do what only He can do? Moreover, he says that just because there, and I want us to see this, that just because you're planning uh, doesn't mean that you shouldn't plan yourself out of opposition. He's, he's planning, he's staying because there's opposition. He says just because there's opposition doesn't mean you give up. Verse 8 and 9, he says, I will stay in Ephesus until Pentecost. That's, that's a week of the feast, which is an Old Testament celebration that ends 50 days after Passover. So he's giving them a calendar marker. But he says, for, the, the door, for a wide door of effective work has been opened to me. And... There are many adversaries. Like, it's hard. Like, hey, actually, there's, there's a great window of opportunity for me to, to, to do ministry, but people hate me here. So I'm going to stick around. Like, that's what he's saying. I got more work to do. So just because there's opposition doesn't mean you give up or quit or change at locations. That's what he's saying. Sometimes, I want us to see this, sometimes the hardest seasons are the most fruitful. I want you to think in your life, sometimes the hardest seasons are the seasons that God wants to produce the, the most fruit. Always think about it this way. The best wine is grown in the most arid, harsh environments. And so what, what is wine, the, the grapes on a vine uh, uh, used for? To produce fruit in order to create wine so that people can enjoy it, right? So God wants to produce fruit in your life, and sometimes the best fruit comes through adversity, comes through hard times, tough seasons that God wants you to endure, to face opposition perhaps, so that you could see God work in and through you and produce a fruit that could not be bore in any other environment. You need an arid environment. So, and that's what it's like for Paul. He, he's in a, he has... The door is wide open for effective work. He's like, I'm getting so much done for the kingdom. And people hate me for it. I got to stick around longer because that door is open. And it's not going to always stay open. But I, I got work to do. It, it, he, he's going to remain faithful and endure even when the season is hard. And so, but again, he's thinking about it according to a calendar. He, he, he's pointing to a, a specific time at the end of Pentecost, a calendar point that he's going to move on from Ephesus and, and head, hopefully, to see the Corinthians. That's his plan. 
Ministry not only requires uh, calendaring, planning, but it also requires partnerships. And so Paul has partnerships. He needs relationships, friendships, community along the way. Verse 8, uh, sorry, verse 10. It says, then, t- then when Timothy comes, see that you put him to ease among you, for he is doing the work of the Lord. So this is another pastor, fellow friend and pastor uh, uh, under Paul that's he's, he's, he's coming to Corinth and he says, put him to, to ease when, I come, when he comes to you. He's doing the work of the Lord as am I. And he says, verse 11, let no one despise him. Apparently this was a thing. Paul writes to Timothy in, uh, in First and Second Timothy to, to encourage him. As, uh, we studied that book last year, those books. Uh, but one of the things he tells them is that don't let anyone look down on you or despise you because of your age. You're young. So it's a young pastor that apparently the people in, in Corinth might be uh, likely to despise him. Also, the, the church he, he pastored in Ephesus were looking down on him because of his age. And so this is a young leader. Some people are, are, are despising him because for various reasons. One of them being his age. And, and so Paul's writing to vouch for him. Sometimes ministry is vouching for other ministry leaders, even to the church you're a part of. Like, hey, this dude's the right guy. He's the right guy for the job. Like, I don't know. I think the other guy is. Well, you don't know the other guy. You don't know, I didn't know his character. You, you don't know. Paul's like, Timothy's the guy. He's a godly guy. Encourage him uh, and, and, and help him be on his way in peace so that he may return to me, it says, for I'm expecting him with the brothers. Like, I need him for ministry. Don't beat him up. Encourage him while he's there so you can send him back to me in one piece and encourage. I don't need another pastor being depressed. Like, it's just, you know, it's just a thing. And so let's, let's try to encourage him so that he can get back with me on the ministry trail and be encouraged. Encourage Timothy. Help him. Now, concerning your brother uh, Apollos, I strongly urged him to visit you uh, with the other brothers. So Paul is saying, there's another pastor named Apollos. He was a great preacher, ministry leader. Um, uh, he was even, we're told that he was a better, he's one of the best preachers of the New Testament. Great preacher. Um, and so uh, Paul's like, hey, I urged him to visit you, another ministry partner. But he says this, it was not at all his will to come. And he will come when he has an opportunity. So this, Paul, uh, this is the reality. Sometimes you want people to join you on ministry, but God has a different assignment for them. Apollo says, hey, I want to come, but just not now. I got, I, I, I got to finish what I'm doing. He says he doesn't have the opportunity. He will come when he has the opportunity. So sometimes with ministry leaders or ministry partnerships, you, you, you desire for other folks to participate, and maybe it's not your season to participate in a certain ministry. We have a need, uh, and, and maybe it's your season to, to step into that need. Maybe it's your, your time to, to, to serve in another capacity, in another ministry, to have another opportunity. Um, but but uh, God gives the assignment to the church, and he, he petitions or he, he, he puts people in places for the purpose in, in specific ministries and, t- and according to his time. It wasn't Apollos' time. He was waiting for the opportunity. What I'm going to do right now is we're going to skip verse 13 to 14. We'll come back to it in a minute, but I want to keep talking about partnerships. Verse 15. Now I urge you, brothers, uh, you know that the household of Stephanus uh, were the first converts in Achaia. This is awesome. The first Christians in this region. Like this is like... Th- they, they love Jesus. He has ministry partners, but he also, we also see the first converts. And he's like, they're coming. They're, they're coming. Um, and they have devoted themselves to the service of the saints. Like, they're committed to Jesus in his church. So this is you. If you're a first-generation Christian, you got saved. Perhaps you got saved at the well, and you're all in. You're like this guy. I know you don't get a verse in the Bible, but this guy gets just his name. That's you. You got saved, and you love Jesus, and you love his church, and you're committed. And Paul's commending this guy. He's commending such men and women to do this type of thing, be committed to Jesus and his church. And he says, be subject to, to, uh, as these to every fellow worker in the Lord. So these are the first converts, first Christians. Uh, they were non Christians. They became Christians. They're devoted to Jesus. It's awesome. And he says, I rejoice in the coming of Stephanus. This is the, the same man in and Fortuneus and Achaicus, because they have made up for your absence. Like, I've been able to be with you, Corinthians, and they've been getting it done. New Christians refreshed, they, 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 for they refreshed my spirit, and, and they're going to refresh yours. Ever been around a new Christian that's just sold out? Get encouraged. Like, man, I remember when I used to evangelize like that, and you're like, hey, I don't anymore, because uh, I just got jaded and, you know, uh, they will too one day. No, don't be like that. Go, how, how can I learn from you? How can, how can I be encouraged? How can, can you reignite the flame in my own heart? I'm jaded and, and discouraged, but you're not yet. So let me learn from you. Let me grow from you. Let me be encouraged by you. Paul says that he's even been refreshed by their energy, their, their commitment to the Lord. He says, give recognition to such people. 
He's, he's like recognizing they need to be they need to be recognized in the church, not like a, a title, but going, man, they need the clap. They need to be pointed to you're doing a great job. You're doing a great job. And notice he's not saying, you know, recognize the people who who aren't zealous. He, he, he's, he's doing this on purpose because he wants the, this church to go be like these guys, be like these guys, be zealous for Jesus and his ministry. They're new converts. Keep up the ministry. Keep the mission going. What ministry is, I want us to see again, that ministry is about people. It takes people to do ministry. These ministry partners are Paul's ministry partners, but they're the Corinthians ministry partners because we're all a part of the, the same mission. We're all part of the same partnership. And that's what God has done. He's invited us into his kingdom, his mission. That's ministry. And so this is ministry partnership, that, that we partner with God according to the gifts he's given us, that he gave us, and the calling he's, callings he's given us, uh, meaning we're all on the same team. And we are to steward all that we have for Jesus, his mission. And so everyone here, everyone here right now, you're, you're, the, the well, we are mini- here at the well, we are ministry partners. I want to see this. We are ministry partners like Paul has ministry partners. And we are partners to work together for the glory of God and to serve this great city so this great city can know the love of Jesus. And they can, they can, this cannot be their, their, their last place before they face God. Um, uh, that, mean, well, that they would face, they would, this would be the last place they would, they would be before they face God, but in joy, in commendation, not condemnation. They'd face the presence of the Lord gladly. They cannot wait for his return because they got saved, they got changed like we have. And so the final instructions he gives, and let's go back to verse 13 and 14. He says this, be watchful, be watchful. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men. Be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. He's saying watch out. His last instructions, his last instructions that he's giving to this church about the mission, about the ministry, in the ministry that they're doing, what are the instructions for the team? Watch out. Pay attention. Watch out for false teachers. Watch out for false doctrine. Watch out for wolves. Watch out for people who want to distort Jesus' mission, corrupt the Bible, to, to deviate from God's word, will, and ways. Watch out for those who want to discourage you on Jesus' mission, who want to tempt you to follow some other God or other way or other path other than Jesus and his path. Uh, watch out. Pay attention. That's what he's saying. Watch out. And then stand firm. Meaning opposition may come, people may not like you, but stand firm, endure to the end, don't give up. And what does he say? Stand firm in the faith, meaning keep believing, like continue to be a Christian. Like, you know what's the most rare thing in this day and age? To be a Christian for your life. Like, everyone's really good about being like a, you know, a Christian for a few years. Like, that's like the norm. Like, everyone has a Christian stage, they're like, I'm a Christian. And like, in America, like, look around, ask your friends. Oh, so many people, yeah. It's co- becoming less and less, but there's a lot of Christian phases. There's not many Christians who endure to the end. I mean, tr- tr- truth be told, only Christians endure to the end. However, but those who call themselves Christians. And so we live in a world where, where there's, there's so many people who uh, don't keep believing. They don't keep hoping. They don't keep trusting. They don't keep obeying. They don't stay Christians. And there's a myriad of reasons why, and this is why he wants them to watch out, pay attention, stand firm, guard their doctrine, hold the line, don't give up, continue in the faith. I want you to endure to the end, be a Christian to the end. And that's my open prayer for every single one of you, is that we would not just be Christians for a season, but for a lifetime. That we love Jesus not just now, but for eternity. He says, act like men. The point here is to grow up. That's what he's saying. Grow up. If you remember the whole book of 1 Corinthians, they need to grow up a lot. They need to mature a lot, a lot. He's saying grow up. His last word to them is grow up. Stop feeling sorry for yourself. Act like an adult. Be mature. You are, he wants them to walk in maturity. Stop acting like children. We're, we're called to have childlike faith and not uh, be childish with our faith. We, we trust God like a child trusts you to, just, um, to provide. Like, boom, well, we trust but we're not childlike and we're not whining, complaining. We grow up, we're, we walk in our calling, we're mature. We join, if you need to help in this, we have community groups, we have discipleship groups. We want to help you do that. Act like an adult, he says. He says, be strong, be strong. There's so many, there's so many Christians or so many people who view Christianity as just a, a, a posture of weakness. It is, in one sense. Paul says it, when I'm weak, then I am what? Strong. Eh, you're not really weak. That's the thing. Like weakness is strength. 
And, and she's like, well, 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 it may feel like weakness, but God is working power and might through you. There's strength. He's saying, endure, don't give up, be strong, don't be a pushover, don't be soft, don't be a complainer, be strengthened by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, be strengthened by your faith. We, we know that faith comes by what? Hearing, hearing of the word of Christ, hear the word of Christ, be strengthened by God's word. This is the same thing God tells Joshua when he's called him on a mission to possess the promised land. He says, be strong and courageous. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and and courageous. God's word should strengthen God's people so that God's people can be about God's mission. Be strong. That's his word. Have courage. And he says, let all you do be done in love. So it's final instruction to them. Hold the line, watch out, don't give up, don't fall prey to heretics, don't believe false Christians, false teachers, keep loving people, keep serving people, keep trusting Jesus, keep following Jesus, keep obeying Jesus, be strong in your faith, and love, and love. Now, how does he define love? Well, he, he wrote all about it in chapter 13. He, what he's not saying is adopt the world, whatever culture you have, so you have love, do everything according to the way they define love. He's saying, do everything you do according to God's definition of love. In, in chapter 13, love is what? Patient. You're impatient, be patient. Love is kind. You're not kind, be kind. Love is not self-seeking. It's not proud. It's not arrogant. It's not rude. But it also doesn't rejoice in wrongdoing. Like our culture says, love is rejoicing in wrongdoing. Jesus says, nope, nope, nope. We don't rejoice in wrongdoing, but we rejoice in the truth. Stand firm in those things. Don't give up on those things. Keep loving. Keep being patient. Don't be proud. Don't be arrogant. Don't be rude. Don't be do any of those things. But also, don't compromise. Love does not compromise. Love does not rejoice in wrongdoing. Re- love rejoices in the truth. Love endures. You've got to endure heretics. You've got to endure opposition. You've got to endure people who hate you and don't like you. Endure to the end. This is what love actually empowers the mission. Only if it's love according to God's word, will, and ways. So these are the final instructions. So I hope that we as a church, that we would hold the line. That we would watch out for, for heretics, false teachers, false doctrine. That we would keep loving one another, keep serving one another, keep loving Jesus, stay Christian. Stay tethered to God's word, not edit it, but proclaim it, submit to it, be strong in our faith, in love according to God's word, will, and ways. And he ends with this, verse 19 through 23, the final greeting. He says some interesting things. The churches of Asia send you greetings. Awesome. So other churches are pumped. They're, they're, they're happy for what God's doing in, 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 in Corinth. Uh, uh, Quillam and Presca, uh, together with their church in their home, uh, send hearty greetings in the Lord. So another church, a small house church getting started, uh, they, they send their greetings to this church as well. All the brothers send your greetings. So all these Christians, man, they love you. They're proud of you. They're for you. They're, they're with you. Your partner, ministry partners, they are excited about what God is doing there. And he says, greet one another with a holy kiss. You know, this is the only verse that I'm like full cessationist on. Like uh, this one ceased. And so uh, this is, you, it's uh, uh, it, it was a different method at that time. It's more like a holy fist bump after COVID, you know. Um, but uh, that's another joke. But uh, uh, this is a type of greeting. He's, what he's saying is they all love you. They're excited to see you. They're excited for what God is doing in your church. Keep it up. Keep going. We love you. They love you. They send their greetings. They're excited. They got the newsletter. They're seeing what's going on on Instagram. They've been liking, commenting. They are excited. Let the church know how excited they are. And, and that's what he's saying. Verse 21. And this is where Paul, he's like, that's, ba- that's the end of the letter. So Paul's likely to have had someone uh, writing this letter, and he's dictating it. And he goes, hold on, at the very end, hold on. Now, now hand me the pen. Verse 21. I, Paul, write this greeting in my own words, in my own hands. So he's, this, is, this last part, he's writing it with his own hands. It's likely that the rest of the book was written by a secretary or someone like that. And so he says this, verse 22. And so he says, this is my words to you. If anyone does not love the Lord, let him be accursed. Like this, that's the sentence he wanted to add in. Like, I'm going to explain it. It is harsh. Like, but this is like, Paul is like, hold on, good letter. Hold on, let me, let me, let me say one more thing. Let anyone who does not love the Lord, let him be accursed. Like, like, the word means, it's literally the Greek word anathema, which is everlasting destruction from the presence of God. Like, 
anyone who doesn't love the Lord, let them go to hell. Like, that's literally what he is saying. Like, you're like, oh, it's offensive. Like, it probably was offensive for them too. Uh, and then he responds with, oh, Lord, come, which is the word Maranatha, like this longing for the return of Christ. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. And may my love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Amen. What he is saying and it is that I want to authenticate this letter to you. This is my, I'm, I'm writing with my own handwriting. Like, I approve this message, everything that was said. Secretary got it all right. Also, I have one more word for you. And I want to I let you know this is the strong word. And so I'm going to write it with my own hands because what I'm about to say to you is going to be harsh and hard. And I don't want you to think that the, the person, oh, maybe they just misinterpreted what I was saying and, and my secretary got it all wrong. I, want, I have a one few sentences for you. It's going to end with like grace and peace and love. I love you guys. But for those who don't love Jesus, no, I'm not having it. That's what he says. Like to, 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 I, can't, I can't overemphasize this term anathema. Like this literally is like condemnation. Like he's condemning. He's, and, 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 and the point being, as we've talked before, that anyone who doesn't love the Lord is already condemned. We saw Jesus taught that in John 3. But he, this, this heartfelt greeting, heartfelt ending, everyone loves you, your church is doing good. They all send their greetings, greet each other with a uh, you know, uh, holy kiss. We're excited. Man, I'm so proud of you guys. And let me say one last thing. If anyone doesn't love the Lord, may they be accursed. And so this comes after celebrating because he's, he's really passionate about them hearing this. And what he's essentially saying is like, hey, if you're a fake Christian, you're a false teacher, you're, you're an apostate, you're this woke progressive masquerading as a Christian, I don't want to have anything to do with you. When I show up, I'm, we're not family, we're not friends, we're not Christians, we're not talking. We're, and if you're offended by that, then I, I get it. I get it. We don't talk like that in our day. It's because we're so soft and weak, especially in the church. And so he's saying, I don't have anything to do with you. Your path is going to hell. And so head that way. One commentator said on this is that uh, verse 22 reminds us how foreign certain aspects of New Testament Christianity are to many other generations in history. This is foreign to us. You hear this and go, man, he's, he's intolerant, he's a bigot, this is not okay. It, it doesn't sound loving. Shouldn't we be a church that's a safe place for people to deconstruct their faith, to process their trauma? But yes, we should. We should. Church, and he's not saying that they shouldn't. We, churches should be 100% a place, safe place for people to be in process. But for those who are genuinely in process, actually in process, they, they want to love Jesus, but they're struggling to love Jesus. They want to understand what happened to them, maybe the trauma they experienced, but they want to understand it according to God's word, will, and ways. If you want to do that, he's like, man, we're all for that. We are, we are with you. But sadly, many people are not. If you want to love Jesus and you want to process your pain in the context of in the hurt, in the context of the scriptures, let's do it, he says. God heals, God restores. Like, but if you, if you are jumping on the new wave of the new age of deconstruct, apostate, no real love for Jesus, no real love for his word, no real love for his ways, just, you're just finding ways to, ed, wanting people to edit God's word or affirm your false beliefs, and that's what you're really looking for, then he says, I don't have anything to do with you. I, you're not, no, we're not having, we're not, we're not going down that rabbit hole. When I show up accursed, be to you. I'm just saying, that's what he says. And the commentators are like, man, we don't understand that in our world. Like, absolutely, we don't understand that. But that's what he says. And I'm just the messenger, reading the message. And he follows it up, which is even crazier. He follows it up. I'm like, crazier in the like, we don't, we can't, we can't understand this either. He follows it up with, Lord, come. So what's he saying? It's like, these guys are going to hell. Jesus, come back quick so they can burn quicker. Like, that's what he's saying. Like, he's like, like, hurry up, deal with them, be done. Like, come quick. He longs for the return of Christ. So this, this Maranatha, this word uh, uh, where he says, Lord, come. What well, he's saying, don't love Jesus, you're accursed. For the rest of us, Lord Jesus, come quickly because we need you. We need you. The world is a mess. We need you. And that's what he's saying. And so this should be a reminder to us that, that Christ is returning Christ is returning, and Christians should long for that day. We should want that day. We should celebrate that day. Whether it comes in our lifetime or in someone else's lifetime, we should be like, yes, we want that. We are pro-Jesus returning. 
whenever he wants to. Actually, he doesn't get to decide. The Father does. That's the thing. We always talk about this. Well, Jesus will come back whenever he wants to. No, he won't. He only comes back when the Father decides. He says that his word's not mine. Like when, when, when the Father wants Jesus to return, he will return. And so for those in, in the camp that Paul's saying, hey, you're a curse. You don't have any love for Jesus. You don't really love Jesus. This should be a sober wake-up call that the day is coming like hell is hot, forever is a long time, and it is real, and, and the return of Christ is imminent, and, 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 and it is, it, God loves you, and he sent his son to save you. He's died in your place for your sins. He's resurrected from the dead. He is returning, and he loves you. He loves you. He loves you. He's given himself for you. He's paid your penalty. He wants to wipe away your sins. He wants to take away your shame. He wants to restore you to the rightful image that you were created for. He wants you to walk in his ways and have flourishing and have life and have, have peace and joy and abundance of, of, of blessing in his presence where you'll spend with him now and forevermore. He wants that for you. And Paul wants the church to know this. and He wants non-Christians to hear this. And so they need to respond to that news. Believe in that substitute. Believe in Jesus. The return is real. He said, if you don't want to have anything to do with that, like, your days are numbered, pal. Trust Jesus. Return to him. I love you. So he ends this letter with this sober warning to, to stay near Jesus, to trust Jesus, to stop walking away from Jesus. And this, this desire for the, the return of Christ. He cannot wait to be with Jesus. We should feel the same. And so, with that said, it's an honor, it's a privilege to pastor this church, to preach God's word. Thank you for letting me do it. Let's keep up the work, the ministry that God has given us to do. We make plans. We want to submit to his plans. We want to use his plans, his money, his resources, his time uh, that he's given us to steward for his cause, his mission, his purposes. And so what I want us to do as we end this sermon today and as we head into the next uh, sermon series, I want us to prepare our hearts, prepare our hearts to, to give, prepare our minds to submit to his word, will, and ways, prepare ourselves to trust, prepare ourselves to be a part of what God is doing